The 60s were coming to an end. Men walked on the moon this week. ARPANET, the first step towards the global internet, came online and Benny Hill debuted on Thames TV. The top 10 this week was the province of Titans. This week, of course, being that ending 26th of November, 1969. At number 10, Bob Dylan was slipping away with his countrified Lay Lay Delay from the frequently delightful Nashville Skyline album. Offered as the theme song to Midnight Cowboy, this one made it all the way to number 5. Number 9 is another falling star, a two-week number one record, Sweet Caroline by the king of easy listening, Neil Diamond. Strictly speaking, Elton John outpoints him on both chart weeks and the top 10 easy listening hits, but hey. An anthem for the Boston Red Sox and the song indelibly associated with Diamond, even the hardest of hardcore rockers cannot fail to be moved by the huge sing-along chorus. Another song on a downward trajectory is number eight, Without You, performed by one of the great voices of Australian pop, the late, great Doug Parkinson. A rumbling tower of soulful thunder. If Parkinson had one flaw, it was that he seemed to get bored and move on from style to style and project to project, never really building a stable audience base. He did, however, find regular work as one of the go-to guys for Australian musical theatre, appearing in everything but the nude for many, many years before passing away this March. At seven, we have the wimpiest thing on the charts this week, Gene by Oliver, a slight-voiced North Carolinian. Written by Rod McEwen, a cloying poet who thought he was the next Leonard Cohen, and was the theme to the Academy Award-winning film The Prime of Miss Jean Brodie, and I think we've said quite enough on that. At number six, it's the possibly over-enthusiastic pop vocalist Lou Christie with I'm Gonna Make You Mine, sounding like the refugee from an early 60s girl group. The song did middling business on the charts, peaking this week at number six before dropping off to number 11 next week. And that was the last we ever heard of him. They say that lies can be halfway around the world while the facts are still putting their pants on. I don't care to think about that, but here is Fowl's fantastic world of facts. The biggest mover on the charts this week is the Australian legend and perhaps the smoothest man who ever lived. Also, Rupert Murdoch's favourite singer, Kamal, up 15 spots to number 18 with the sound of goodbye. Bloody legend, Kamal. Evacuating the top 40 in an even greater clip was Tony Joe White with what was, I will wager, his only hit, Poke Salad Annie, down 28 spots and barely clinging in at number 40. The highest debut this week was Mr Turnkey, a rather disturbing follow-up to In the Year 2525 by Zager and Evans, the pathetic story of a rape in Wichita Falls and the subsequent suicide of the perp. Good God, Kamal wouldn't have even remotely contemplated such a thing. And the emeritus record on this week's top 40 is another Aussie legend, Russell Morris with his charming and slightly atypical Girl That I Love, which had racked up 15 weeks. Top Dog in the USA was come together by the Beatles, while in the land of What Ho and Toodle Pip, it was the year's biggest hit and the 443rd biggest hit of the physical era in my hometown, Sugar Sugar by the Archies. On the topic of the Archies, long-term listeners, i.e. those who've listened for the last two weeks, may recall the story of Miss Fifi, who dumped me for a painter who lived in Spring Hill. 1986. Miss Fifi played in a band called the Strange Balustrades who formed a cover of the Archie's Bang Shang Elaine. They didn't want to do Sugar Sugar because they didn't think it was as good a song. Well, you know, follow up. On the local charts, Abbey Road was firmly ensconced at the top of the charts in the middle of an 18 week run at number one. Number five, it's the king of something other than easy listening, Elvis Presley with Suspicious Minds. From what I gather from the lyrics, Elvis appears to be entwined in some kind of trap from which he is incapable of extricating himself on account of his over-uxuriousness, a circumstance he complains about several times during the delivery of the song. 
Now, far be it from me to meddle in the kingly romantic business, but perhaps he would find it easier to walk out of the trap if, for a moment, he tried loving his inamorato a little bit less, just until he could get out of the trap. I'm just saying. Bit of trivia, Suspicious Minds was actually a second-hand song when Presley released it. The writer Mark James had a flop with it the year before on the Scepter label. Totally dominating fourth place is a record that spent a week at the top a fortnight or so ago. Local boy Ross D. Wiley with The Star. Reaching the top doubtless due to Wiley's popularity as host of the influential pop music show Uptight, the record had run its race by the first week of 1970 and stumbled from the charts. It was to be his last ever hit. It's the Beatles at number three with something back by Come Together. Amazingly, number three was as good as it got for this wonderful record. And this confused the Beatles somewhat because generally they only did number ones, with the occasional number two if Engelbert Humperdinck had released anything remotely recently. And one has to ask, would it have reached the summit had Come Together been the A-side? Holding down the number two spot is one of the most beloved and famous of Burt Bacharach and Hal David's compositions, I'll Never Fall In Love Again, as sung by Bobby Gentry, a not infrequent visitor to our series. A wonderfully catchy song in the relatively bland a time signature of 4-4 or 2-4 maybe. As someone who loves working out odd time signatures, Bacharach is usually a trove of great stuff. And more of a rock soul feel to the prominent bass line. Gentry seems better served by the light pop format than she does on her previous and subsequent country essays. Anyway, who is it that doesn't know this song? Is there anyone in the Western world? Hey, hey, it's the monkey with this week's number one. It's the one and only Monty the Safety Monkey. Rattle them cans, Monty. El Supremo this week is the mighty mysterious one himself, Mr. Roy Orbison with Penny Arcade. Part past its shelf life psychedelia, part patented Orbisonian melancholy, part old school rock and roll, this was Roy's sixth and final number one in Australia. And his next to last top 40 entry until his duet of crying with Katie Lang made number two in 1987. Crying had been a number one in 1960. Despite the drop-off in chart activity, Roy was a regular tourer down here in Australia and would sell out venues wherever he went. I once worked with a chap who worked his way up from stagehand to stage manager at our town's regular mid-size arena, held about 5,000 people, and when I asked him the best act he'd ever worked with, he unhesitatingly said, Roy Orbison. And that's the way the cow ate the cabbage in the week ending 26th of November 1969. As the so-called golden decade slipped away this week, it's in effect a look back in miniature at what made the decade so memorable. The king still clutching his scuffed, tarnished and slightly askew crown, the chief cultural architects of 60s music both on the charts, along with a man who threatened to be the same for the 70s, three Australian acts and the first rumblings of bubblegum music making their way up through the radio speakers. I do sincerely hope to see you all again sometime in the past and somewhere in a foreign country.